It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. When Latter-day Saint Apostle Elder Jeffrey R. Holland visited Oxford University in England last year, he became fast friends with the Reverend Dr. Andrew Teal of Pembroke College. The two of them hit it off so well that Elder Holland invited Dr. Teal to visit Brigham Young University. So earlier this year, I had the chance to sit down with Dr. Teal to talk about his life as a chaplain, about interreligious dialogue, about faith, hope, and charity, and other things. Questions and comments about this mini-episode can be sent to me at mipodcast.byu.edu. But before we get to Dr. Teal, let's check out a review of the month. I don't think I've done this one yet. This comes from Random Nickname 43 who says, I've been impressed at how consistently Blair is able to engage the different guests on the show so that the conversations are in-depth and substantive rather than just surface level. Listening to an episode always feels like eavesdropping on a conversation between thoughtful and interesting people. Thank you, Random Nickname 43. It means a lot to me to read your review. If you would like to leave us a review, you can do that in Apple Podcasts or leave a comment on Facebook or YouTube or whatever app you listen to. See if it has a review feature. And now we turn to the discussion with Reverend Dr. Andrew Teal of Pembroke College, Oxford. We're joined today by the Reverend Dr. Andrew Teal of the Church of England. He's a chaplain, a fellow and lecturer in theology, and it's at Oxford. Which school is it? Pembroke? Pembroke College, yeah. Okay, so Pembroke College of Oxford. Thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Is that all right if I call you Andrew? Sure, take Okay, care, please. perfect. Well, what brings you to Brigham Young University? Maybe let people know a little bit about who you are and what brings you here. Okay. Just about four months ago, we had a, something in, in Oxford where Elder Holland came, and from the moment he stepped out of the car when he came to speak to the university faculty of theology it was evident that here was somebody who was uh, fun vivacious profound committed and worth knowing and uh, i'm delighted i knew his son matthew but we, we struck up a, a, an immense and respectful friendship i think he's one of the greatest men alive that i know and i know quite a lot of great men but he is there's something incredibly uh, wonderful about him and he said well you've got to come you've got to come to general conference and you've got to come and see BYU, and you've got to come and see people, and, and uh, you don't say no to a guy like that, and I didn't, and I'm, it's been a whirlwind, a sort of a real, I hate to use the word avalanche because it's snowing here at, the <laughs> moment, uh, at BYU, but, but a, a, a real a fountain of blessings. I can't tell you how much, how much it will, it's burnt its way into my understanding and changed what I've thought about what I knew about. So it's been a tremendous time. Mm. Yeah, spending time with people face to face, I mean, it's the best way to overcome our natural short sightedness. In Brown Bag yesterday, you joined us uh, here at the Maxwell Institute and you mentioned something about General Conference, about some of the people that you encountered as you walked outside. And I thought that was a, an interesting story, if you wouldn't mind sharing that about so, some of the. Uh, I'm wearing a dog collar. That's not good for not you're not good for podcast world. But I'm wearing a dog collar, big, partly because I'm not just here because I I want to be here and was asked to be as a person. But you you we represent the institutions of which you're a part. So I'm Church of England, so obviously, and the University of Oxford. So in that sense, you stand out a bit. But I walking in with one or two other people who were being incredibly hospitable to me. There were one or two people who were protesting, shouting stuff so i thought oh embarrassing i'll go over and talk because they'll know i'm mainstream and i'll just try and make make my way through they'll think i'm one of them and you know one of their own and well, i couldn't have been wronger actually and so I, I i felt in a funny sort of way glad to be to be tarred with a similar brush and during the conference one or two of the the, the speakers it's reinforced keep it simple what's our real purpose what are we for well we're to love the redemption of the world isn't about applying a medical solution. It's about loving, about recognizing our, how interwoven we are with everybody and having a vision of ultimate hope. And so eventually sort of began to think, feel sorry for these people carrying the placards and dressed up as Satan and all in a hot day. And eventually, actually, there was a real sense of, of compassion, of recognition that I wasn't the person to start trying to make it better but actually the most important thing is to have this long view the long view that everything that is a countersign of love and hope and and everything that that's try, that tries to strive with violence and brutality against the kingdom of love has a destiny to be embraced one of the things that Elder Holland said in the University Church at Oxford when we were talking and having a theological discussion 
was a tremendous just a tremendous sentence of hope of, of what it is the destiny of each person that every person living every person that has ever lived and everyone who everyone who will ever be has a destiny to be loved and blessed by God beyond our imagining and that sort of vision of absolute scope a tsunami of grace which doesn't wash people away but which which thoroughly sort of seeps in and met, sets everything right all of the the stains and strains of 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 sin and and of pain that people bear that's not the last word so it was it was quite an impression even the outside it was seemed to be an overflowing of grace and on the priesthood session that was fun because it was i go to the football with my son and it's one of the great things you can do it's one of the moments where the, the banter can actually really sort of make make memories that bond and make me very happy and at, at the end of the priesthood session it was uh, there was a great sense of it being like a football crowd without the booze and without the antagonism and it was just a carnival atmosphere and i just thought it's it's great to give men sometimes we're not very good at dealing with emotions blokes one of the ways in which that 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 broke through that was there was a real sense of appropriate tenderness and and connectedness one of the things coming back to elder holland is his capacity when talking to not be embarrassed at all about being an emotional person a person with emotion so he models the fact that if you want to be a real man then cry real tears don't feign but when and when and when the gift of tears comes then let it let it happen and it will give it it, it speaks on a level to somebody else. it's not i don't think one bit of it is manipulative but it speaks on a, on a level beyond words it carves its way through where words can't get it's like what paul was saying where like you know the spirit sort of intercedes with groans that we can't uh, give expression to what strikes me about these two stories you told about meeting elder holland and meeting these protesters is underneath it all you're hitting on this common human connection if someone was to compare those two encounters that you had it would it would seem easy to say oh you met this lovely wonderful person over here and you met these strange sort of angry bitter people over here and those are very different things but it seems like you found something common in meeting those very different people there's a sort of wild hope um, when president nelson was talking i think it was president nelson was talking about the difference between individual salvation for all and the ceiling sitting there as a non-member as a, not a member of the Jesus, church of jesus christ of latter-day saints you know, thought, well that's a bit sad because actually i'd quite like to be sealed with my family eternally there's a sense in which well thinking about it praying about it there was a real sense of the very impulse to love and to trust in god's capacity to to bring everything into perfection and harmony that's the wager that I want to put everything I am on. So it's it's not saying that I don't I don't contradicting the issue the wonder of the sense of assurance of being sealed. But there's another wonder which is well it's hoping against hope that God will be victorious. But not just for me and my family, but for the whole universe, the whole created order will be brought to a harmony which we cannot perceive. And it seems like you're starting to get a glimpse of that perception in your attitude toward those protesters going to walk up to try to fix the situation but yeah. then being surprised by their humanity and even if they don't change in that moment you know i thought I, your questions made me realize i think i learned a bit of respect for them i don't mean respect for what they were doing but recognition that it's not it's not I, we can't fix everything all at once <laughs> And, and me trying to do that would actually disrespect them because, it, you know, it, it's not where they're at. So there's a sense of discernment, yeah. perception that, well, other members of the Church of Jesus Christ were, were walking past and some were singing. There wasn't a, there was no antagonism. And that, that this was almost a model of trust. Don't be disturbed oneself. Don't let these people press your buttons, but don't press theirs back. The, this is a... A community coming together to celebrate the extraordinary hope of human flourishing in Jesus Christ and and therefore even though they may not realize it these protesters are part of that because they're evoking this sense of compassion and empathy 
understanding and hope. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you were there as, as part of that uh, choir, we can call it, uh, with, with all sorts of different parts. Now, you're a theologian as well. You've done work on an early Christian father, Athanasius, and Latter-day Saints aren't very familiar with the early Christian fathers. Athanasius, he wrote a, a really important work on the incarnation of Christ. So he wrote a work on how Christ became embodied, took on flesh, God entering in with humanity. And, and that's an idea that Latter-day Saints would be more familiar with, but the history of it, they're, they're not quite as familiar with. He addressed this book to someone called Marcarius. Is that how you pronounce yeah. the name? Yeah. So we don't know if that's a real person or not. It could mean blessed, happy, or fortunate. But he wanted to present to this person a rational case for the Christian message, right? He wanted to lay out sort of a reasoned case for Christ. I think that's important work. Are there risks to that kind of work? Are there risks to being a theologian? And, and nuance that as much oh, as you want, it? yeah. Well, for example, I mean, in a sense, there's two volume work when he's in exile. He was exiled a lot. He was, yes, he spent most of, his, most of his life away from home. But one of the things in, he talks about, if you like, the, the second work is most famous, On the Incarnation. Yeah. But there's also, if you like, describing how we get to that point, the collapse of, of the apparent collapse of everything. Like the creation, the yeah, fall. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And, and that humanity by itself it seems to have lost the power, the potential to grow. He has this wonderful image which he picks up from Plato of, of humanity being like a charioteer in a chariot with horses just careering towards a wall, a calamity waiting to happen. And that so God has to has to actually act at this point and make an intervention. And only the power of, of God's own word is able to change things. And so at the worst point, Athanasius says, of, of, of the collapse of everything that makes, that, that is supposed to be good, God, the incarnation happens and he becomes human in order that we might become God. You may want to say square brackets again, it's not what he says, but the sense in which that sort of, this is not simply giving, it's not sort of rescuing, it's not like throwing a five dollar bill to somebody on the street and just walking past and thinking you've done your bit. It's really sitting down beside them, listening to their pain at, at great risk and helping them to get up and walk. And taking him to that hotel and paying the, the innkeeper and saying, here, this is for tomorrow and I'll yeah. be back. Yeah. yeah. And anything, any other costs, uh, yeah. they're, they're sorted. So the salvation isn't like just a pat on the head. It's not a, a gong that you get, you know, when you've done a long service award and it's not a, it's not something you that you own or possess it's too big a gift for that for athanasius it's about your very self that that in fact who it's on the level of being not on the level of possessing or doing but who we very who we really really are at our core um, and i think that fits very much into a reading of both an understanding of humanity according to the doctrines of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints and salvation that in fact there is this the reality of what one of our students, one of your students has just dis used the word respecting the reality of fracture. I think that's a fantastic phrase. Whilst trust in ultimate gathering and healing. So looking at the reality of a collapsed and collapsing and, and pointless world, but, but only ever through the spectacles that actually all of this is going to be made thrilling and, and vivid with the very presence of God. So that's the question I have then is with that, with that general salvational narrative in mind for, from Athanasius, then we get down to nitty gritty little points, right? And how far deep down can we go with reason? Are there limits to that? In other words, like when we're doing theology, we're approaching God rationally. And, and are there, are, what are some of the dangers and risks of that? Language of paradox here, because at his best, Athanasius says some, you know, is saying anything that we can say or think about God, don't for one moment think you've got it taped. You cannot wrap God up. So, so the best thing we can say about God is, to, is that what God is not, a so-called uh, tradition called apophatic theology, the best thing. So God is not, you know, well, whatever. But to, then he goes on to, to say, and the best f language, the best, if you like, the best way of, of, of describing this is in, in, in connected up doctrines, which prevent you from from just taking one bit and thinking that's the the lot. The, the irony is the doctrine of the Trinity emerges from this, and the and the whole the creed or symbol of Nicaea. The, the irony is this this then becomes taken to be the literal benchmark, a litmus test of orthodoxy. I do not think that 
Athanasius or the great fathers like Gregory of Nyssa and others for one moment think that their uh, articulation of a creed is what should be worshipped. This is simply perhaps in Athanasius's um, world the best description it's not a definition you can't define you can't pin down but the best description possible from words which don't, don't get close. I don't know if this might be like I hope this isn't blasphemous but the way I've I've thought about this because I, I live in my head a lot, right? And I, and, I, and I worship God as well. But I've sensed that can be a problem when I'm focused too much on what I'm thinking about. And I've thought of God sort of like a wounded bird that I hold in my hands. And the more I want to control that, I risk squeezing the life out of it. I have to hold it loosely. I also don't want it to fly away and get away from me and, you know, and, and go off. But I have this sense of like God is this wounded bird, or the truth maybe as this wounded bird that I have that I have to hold loosely if I'm going to hold it at all. And when it heals enough, it will fly. We won't possess it. Right. We but won't possess yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. That's have to, we the, have to bear it. Yeah. The end of and so the end of this exercise isn't so I'm always so I always have it in my hands. It's it's it just keeps me in relation to it yeah. long enough for yeah. it to be able yeah. to fly. And so yeah. so language about God is less about learning the right vocabulary or the right words than than it's almost like a grammar of a language, a way that yeah. we can learn. We can learn to actually place ourselves and and so for if people think. And I, I, I am uh, in many ways orthodox in theology and, and worship, but if, we, if I for a moment think I'm worshipping the doctrine of the Trinity, I think that's called idolatry. Yeah. The whole point of this is to push you as far as you, you can and then say, right, you've got to let go of the bird and, and cast your hope and your love and your worship on the Father and the Son in the power of the Spirit. Not on a doctrine, however wonderful it seems. Yeah, there's it's there's always a remainder. We have this we have this vision of a world without remainder of this belief system without remainder. We want the equation to, and, and I just I I don't feel that way anymore. I, I've had to learn to be comfortable with remainders. Do I, do, we, do I really know God well enough to tell other people that they're wrong? That's the other thing, you know. Yeah, I'm, yeah. For me, the search, the search, and the cultivation of of a relationship with God has superseded the need to correct or, mm. or um, even to be correct. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's in, cause it's something you live, not necessarily something no, that you have and, in and your that head. That sort of process thing, which I think elder Nel president Nelson spoke about, about that sense of which a process, not, not an instant. Yeah. So the process of redemption, somebody asked a question of me yesterday about how, how do we know when we're asking the right or saying the right theological questions? And I think at the end of the day, we don't, but, if you're a dad or a mum or you have a you know dear friend whatever whatever your circumstances you delight in in people being who they are in your presence even if they're way off you, you can chuckle you can embrace you can love if your child is doing something for the first time and draws you a picture and you have to you have to enthuse about it long enough to realize what it is <laughs> you yeah. know but but you delight in that now the the, the yeah. reality of the god who reveals himself in jesus christ delights in us delights in our systematic incompleteness yeah. and doesn't you know like an ogre demand that we get everything right instantly or yeah. leave the room and 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 this notion of a of, of a perfectionist projection is actually tells us more about our mental ill health than about the God of grace. Yeah, it's our insecurities. That's Reverend Dr. Andrew Teal of the Church of England. We're talking with him today here at the Maxwell Institute where he's visiting from Oxford. I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk about your work as a professor and also a priest together. So you combine a lot of different roles in the work that you do. And I imagine that some of your time is spent with young people, with students. Mm -hmm. A lot of my time. Um, it, it, being a chaplain to a college, a college, you know, f f what were we, 1624? So it's quite, it's, that's one of the modern ones. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's a, a minister to a whole community. So my job is to loiter with intent, to be with, you know, <laughs> with people who, if they're washing up, come and wash up. I, I'm discovering that if I want to talk to my wife, I've got to look her in the face. I can't do something else. I can't multitask with a multitasker. You can't kid somebody. <laughs> um, but guys sometimes can be, especially younger people, but guys especially can feel a little bit embarrassed about looking. And so if you give people the opportunity to do something together, so you go and wash up with somebody in the kitchens or uh, there's a dartboard in my room, which is against college rules. So yeah. <laughs> I hope no one's listening to this. <laughs> 
But if you throw a few arrows and, and people will spill out and start talking about yeah. stuff. So it's about the, the trying to find strategies to be close enough to people to be trusted when it matters, but to be far enough ahead to be worth following. Loitering with purpose is yeah, loitering with beautiful intent. Yeah. or with intent. I think it's a crime actually in Britain. It's there is a there is a crime. <laughs> loitering with oh, intent. So that's so even standing, like a penal statute. Standing outside <laughs> the bank great. waiting for it to that's close. That's fantastic. So in these interactions, then what I wanted to know is what are some of the most common concerns that people bring to? It seems like we're living in an era where there's a lot of unrest, uncertainty, political issues, a lot of questions about the existence of God or what God's like, or you know, all of these different things that people wrestle with. What are what are the common concerns that young people bring to you when they say, I need, I need a hand, I need, I need some help on this? I think a lot of people in the UK, student, um, young people in the UK who are at university feel incredibly pressured that one of the things about British culture in America, which are strikingly different, I think, is, is that it's cool in Britain to be disinterested, to be nonchalant, to be not motivated. It's cool for American students, visiting students, to actually get excited a lot of people have striven to get to university at Oxford. The, the demands are immense. You know, it's our equivalent of an Ivy League university. Yeah. And then they come and they, and, and they can feel exhausted and sometimes, a sh you know, imposter, as if they don't deserve to be there, quite isolated. The, the demands of work can be really, really stretching. Isolation, um, even though there's this social media and all these other types of connections. And even though you're living with other people yep. and you know people in your you know, yep. corridors and stuff. Isolated in yeah. a crowd. Because, yeah, exactly, because in a way everyone's just not pretending, but almost posturing to be, and, and there's a real, there can be a big sense of um, unworthiness. So it's really important, I think, to try to, to listen, to attend, to respect. There are also a spectrum of other issues. You've got 18-year-olds leaving home for the first time. So you've got questions about identity. You've got questions about relationships. One of the things a chaplain is, as a priest, is not part of the structural responsibility of college. So if you tell any officer of the college, you're telling the college. If you tell a, the chaplain, you're telling the chaplain. And that, that, is, that has a different boundary. So that can be hard. So about 10, 12 years ago, there was someone who came and, and asked in absolute confidence to tell me that they were doing something and it was about getting, getting knives actually in their room. So I had to ask, both respect what they were doing, but also ask, well, why are you, why are you telling me? What can I do with that? Yeah. And eventually we moved that it wouldn't, with that person's permission, to move to the other structures and to, to intervene. But it's really important, to, I think, to dare to risk to say, well, if I, if I decide for you, if I take away your self-reliance, I'm actually contributing badly to the rest of, you know, but you have to, have to engage and think of the whole as well. So it's quite, a, it's quite a stretching thing to be a chaplain. I mean, it, that, that's the, you know, a very vivid and a very um, unusual example. Most of the time, it's about trying to humanize and to make it make it clear that, that you're available, that you're interested, that you really want people to flourish, and that if I can't sort it, to be able, with their permission, to refer on uh, to other systems and to and to care. So that's that's great. I love being a chaplain actually because it's unpredictable, and it appeals to my short attention span because things happen and I have to think quickly about it. That's the Reverend Dr. Andrew Teal. He's joining us here at the Maxwell Institute where we had a brown bag event and you also went to general conference. You're uh, meeting with different uh, members of the church and leaders of the church and it, it's a real treat to have you here and I know Spencer Flumen, our director here, has, has already started dropping hints about wanting to have you come back. So I, I You're hope... trying to stop me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good, good. The last thing I wanted to talk about here before we wrap up is the idea of interfering faith discussion in general. And, and to tie it back to Athanasius, someone that you study, he was no stranger to controversy himself, right? So, you know, what he defended ultimately became central to Orthodox Christianity. But at the time he was writing, he was in the minority. He was sort of seen as a heretic. He faced a lot of persecution. Today, the stakes are a little bit different. People in our two countries, at least, aren't generally exiled or face these kind of things. But there is still religious tension. There's still religious disagreement. So I wanted to hear your thoughts about how to deal with those kind of dynamics and, and how your conversations with Elder Holland from, from our church have, have played into your efforts. Okay. I think there's several steps. I think the base fun foundation is religious freedom. We have to be a, a society which encourages 
and supports and embraces religious freedom, freedom of, of for you to think differently about God than I do. Uh, and then after that comes, well, what, what about the humanity? Where, where might an encounter like that lead us? Might it actually lead me to understand how different people's takes on God can make me realise that actually, oops, I haven't got it all, all taped up. One of the things we're doing in college chapel every Sunday, we have members of different denominations and even different religions come and speak within the framework of Anglican choral evensong. One of those speakers was uh, an imam from a local Muslim community and he came and we tried to, uh, we were, he wanted us to do the service that we normally did but we asked, he asked a girl to do the call to prayer, uh, the Islamic call to prayer, as the introit as we walked in before the organ. Mm. Now he said vi very vividly, he said, as a, I come as a Muslim, I speak as a Muslim. This is not my faith. However, for me to be the best Muslim I am, I need you to be the best Christian you are to the congregation. I'm not coming here to try to, to, to change you into a Muslim, but I'm neither am I coming here to try and water it down into a, into a third thing. I want you to be who you are. You will make me become a better Muslim, and me being a better Muslim will make you be a better Christian. And I think that's, the, in a way, the longer view, the bigger view, where religious freedom starts a path of religious affirmation and then appreciation. And, and love so that we can then act together. Think of New Zealand recently, I don't know yep. um, whether that's been known about. Oh, it is, the, it's very known Prime here. Prime Minister of New Zealand and the people, the Christian people of New Zealand, how she's handled that with compassion and yeah. openness. It's great and, leadership. And apparently Muslims in, in New Zealand have said there isn't a safer place to be a Muslim now. <laughs> when Christian people went and, and protected mosques after that and stood outside so put themselves as barriers and and that sign of solidarity i think so so first of all religious freedom then appreciation and tolerance and then uh, mutual mutual love so those are the stages and that's what i want to be part of i as told people um, very honored to have dinner with elder holland and sister patricia holland on monday night together with the chair of the court of the twelve and I commit myself as an Anglican and, and as somebody in Oxford to be part of, to do everything I can to be a part of the reconciliation of our communities because it matters. So that's that's where I am here. I'm Thank you. Delighted. I, Thank you. Yeah. Can I just use a, a moment of the time to say sure. everybody who has been a part of this, it's been a source of immense joy, challenge, been like a, a complete a, a river of blessings. And I do want to say thank you to everybody who's who's been so kind and welcoming. And we, we've been thrilled too. This has been incredibly uplifting, and I can't thank you enough. The pleasure. Uh, that's the Reverend Dr. Andrew Teal of the Church of England. He's a chaplain, a fellow, and lecturer in theology at Oxford, Pembroke College in particular. And hopefully... Uh, in the future, we'll have an opportunity to talk again because you and I have a shared interest in disabilities and theology as well. So we'll kind of put that out there as a teaser. We want to continue conversations with you. And until then, I'm Blair Hodges. This is the Reverend Dr. Andrew Teal, and this is the Maxwell Institute Podcast. Mm -hmm.